I hope so. At least the terminology for sure. Again, extremely tricky. I mean, if you get into the nitty gritty, and I think uh, you guys are starting to do that with your oral, which are, are great because you got the idea. The idea to talk about management or landscape in that case, right? Correct for the second oral. Is that landscape is the keyword? So uh, that gives me a chance to hear about stuff I don't have. A chance to do here on PowerPoint. I wouldn't want to be, uh, you know, make stuff too permanent when it's just the integrity of a 2018 research study, which are the basics for understanding a technical. You have to read a hundred papers, individual papers, Australia, New Zealand, whatever, on whatever species, and then come up together with uh, and that's what textbooks are all about. They're all written reviews one after the other. So what you guys are contributing to the course is great as far as I'm concerned. It's just a, an excuse for contacting the world of wildlife management, see what's being done out there. So uh, obviously I'm trying to tackle uh, this in uh, various ways. And one thing I haven't mentioned, <laughs> here I get the chill, uh, the course evaluation will come uh, shortly i believe uh, say yes if you've seen any email about that no students have been contacted so i think it's uh registrar organizes the course evaluation online i think it's going to be a d2l for each course and they ask each faculty to make sure that you have enough time eventually you know free some time for you guys to go uh, do the course evaluation so uh And then if you want to bet that uh, I can uh, share a screen, are we betting? No, because the button's right there. I wouldn't bet if I already know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, but it won't give me permission. Oh, look at that. Are you sure? I just got it back to you guys. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, <coughs> I want to finish on the course of that, which is very, very important that this course, as I taught it, uh, about teaching it is uh, the first uh, first trial. I'm sure there's two, uh, it's fragmented to use a word we get very popular in this course. So that means there's all kinds of uh, gaps to fill and stuff like that. Uh, some people might be wondering and addressing myself to a fairly large crowd, over 40 people who Maybe you'll wonder on a Saturday, uh, why is it that we haven't checked in the uh, live traps, uh, techniques, uh, uh, databases, how about modeling, simulation, <laughs> computer, and so on. So for example, the lab exercise could be, could be amplified. So if you guys have come up already with some, some ideas that some stuff is, could have been covered or covered better, then uh, I'd like to hear about it. You can leave it anonymous, absolutely. There's no question. Thank you very much. That's going to help me uh, greatly. I'll add a question around to the TAs and the techs and find out if the course is, uh, they say, uh, well rounded, you know, like if we cover most of the, the topics, the, the aspects. So, without further ado. So I think uh, we, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we were possibly totally done with this. I'm not sure. Oh. Like somewhere. Okay, so of course the topic is Habitat Universal as opposed to uh, or class just talk. Anyone wants to talk about the I-I? Raise your hand if you have heard of the I-I. Anybody? <laughs> Okay, there's a pet store that has them or what? <laughs> this is not Sudbury, guys. I, I is not Sudbury. Where is it? Anybody? Sorry, can you repeat that? Where do you find the I? I, I think it's Africa. 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 Oh, yeah, you got it. Yeah. You got it. Is it like the creepy mammal with like the long? 
Oh yeah? Okay. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> no worries. I had to show it to everyone. I'm very proud of it. I got a short one, but they have a right. So the I is a lever. All right. And uh, yeah, it's known for its name. Easy in primary school, it can teach you II, people will know, right? So uh so um we covered this uh, pretty boring stuff just to say that Canada has uh, said something about uh, uh, habitat conservation. So it's still within in line with the topic. You remember that you bring in uh, the uh, final exam a series of uh, ecosystems that should represent a habitat because in most description for most, okay, for many species, uh, ecosystem defines the habitat. So the pocket gopher is a prairie animal and so on, right? So we're gonna get more into that. That the thing is that we still have to be modest. I mean, it's just over, maybe an oversimplification for many, many species to think that they belong only to the prairie. And questions for the exam, name a, the terminology here, I want to, I'm going to say habitat specialist. Definition is belong to one ecosystem, but to keep it simple, habitat specialist is an animal, uh, sorry, an animal that uh, belongs, uh, uses uh, one ecosystem. So obviously the opposite is a habitat generalist. And of course, it uses more than one ecosystem, just to keep it simple, just to uh, try to translate the word habitat, which is sort of a, what's the definition, if I want to try it, the definition of habitat, it's more backwards in this course. Yeah, definition of habitat. Type of environment that the animal lives in. Yeah, survives and reproduces. Thank you very much. So let's make it fourth year level. So it's uh, where they survive and reproduce. So living is tricky. They could be transient and therefore that's not its habitat. This animal could be uh, traversing uh, a matrix of some sort. I reckon that language. So we got the habitat specialists. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, I mean the list, right? Yeah. So you have many that you can bring to the to the exam right here. Try to pick a, you know, a prairie dog that you find in the forest. I say you call the ministry right away. <laughs> so some animals are like that, of course, and there's have that. So I try to simplify again. And if somebody dares to tackle a project that has to do with landscape ecology, where you're supposed to look at habitat patches. Well, you're supposed to be defining the ticket of habitat. Well, if you're dealing with a coyote, I say, good luck. Get started now because in the list, I say prairies, check, forest, check. Lakes, maybe not, but although they might wait for a beaver every now and then, so they, they might depend on lakes and so on. That's a habitat generalist more than one ecosystem. So, in order to be a true biologist, you got to be modest and say, "No, I can't deal with landscape ecology for every species. Let's deal with something that's pretty, pretty straightforward." Woodland caribou is a good example of a habitat specialist, right? This animal depends strictly on for, uh, arboreal uh, lichen. I don't know about the genetic structure between that and the barren ground, for example. But the thing is, I think there are, if I'm not mistaken, they are genetically isolated. Just like uh, name another species that's in the prairie, but that has a subspecies in the woods. Anybody in the wolf is not a bear. Bison is a very good answer for sure. So. Typical bison is your prairie bison. Bison, bison, bison. Yeah, I can't help that. And I found that early in my during my bachelor's. <laughs> no, it's a deep one, right? I wonder this one. And then uh, 
you've got uh, some uh, northern region, the Atapa species, the subspecies, and you get the wood python as well. So, habitat uh, that's a long story for habitat specialists. Easier to work with question at the exam again, uh, think of an original question. Which animal uh, I could, uh, if uh, we've just been discussing this, I could show habitat, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put, up, I'm going to put an additional slide for habitat generalist. I want you to be practical and say the ministry wants you to work on the priority versus prairie dog. Which one would you work for landscape ecology? Think, it, think ahead of time because you're not dealing with the habitat patch. You're doing landscape and you're going for the region. Well, you better know exactly where habitat is and what isn't habitat. Correct? All right. So the answer would be uh, if you're in the prairies, I would pick the prairie double over the coyote, right? So far, that's what we've talked about. Same. So these are all pretty uh, specialists. I mean, mice is too general here, but definitely animals that belong to one, one ecosystem. Really simple. And uh, you realize that if you're a specialist, that means the rest is no good for you. That means that uh, out of eight, there's seven uh, uh, ecosystems that are matrices, that are matrix to this animal. Uncomfortable, not prone for survival or reproduction. That's the definition of matrix. Uh, so I guess, uh, have I talked about this? Yes, no. I have a text before. So uh, and if I put a C in your name, slap me. Uh, so um, here's uh, my take on this. So we're going to be talking landscape ecology as in Habitat is easy to circumscribe. I think that the whole theory of landscape ecology comes from simple landscape. Think of a desert, and I have an oasis of that. That's habitat, that's matrix. Pretty contrasted, pretty easy to in, in, understand that one species can live in the oasis, not in the desert. So the contrast is always uh, easy now. So this, these are people saying, come on, uh, researchers, do a little better in your understanding of habitat relationships by understanding some principles that we're going to see that's called the landscape ecology theory, you know. So, but at the other end, I got, there's people like me who uh, walk the, the trail. It's not modeling. You're walking the trails and you say, oh, I got first look, I got marked. I made one observation, that's called empirical approach. Empirical approach is a good term for the exam. It's not experimental, it's empirical. I learn as I go on habitat uh, relationships for mark. Uh, uh, sorry if I go to Mark right away, of course. For me, I'm biased. I'm thinking I, every time I see a black spruce, and I'm keeping this simple. Every time I see a black spruce, I see mark. I have a habitat relationship, correct? So I can identify what is suitable, what's not suitable for mark based on number. Now, and I, again, this is something I'll develop eventually, but right now I'm making a little uh, aparte just to understand that most biologists approach from the field up and try to come up with a, uh, an under, understanding of what's happening in the region of suffering. Most well, people will go to Capriol, sample Capriol, and put them together eventually. The landscape pathologists went down instead and say, listen, you guys, uh, you, you've done well, but not entirely. So it's two worlds. A, a biomathematician on one side, Pigeons at lunchtime going back to their lab to do more computing. Then you got field ecologists who prefer to be out in the bush and they believe in the real world. <laughs> Not so many, the other ones don't. 
And essentially, since I started my bachelor's, I've always noted that is that every conference, it's two worlds. You, a modeler cannot talk to a, at lunch time, they will not talk to a field ecologist because they don't have the same perspective on this. So, uh, the landscape ecology is simplified. So, modeling is simplifying now, correct? The empirical study adds complexity. Every time I walk in a traditional water, I have a new observation that's slightly different from the previous one. So, empirical is complex. Takes time, of course. The best studies on my group of animals is uh, from, uh, say, uh, Hans Kruk in, uh, on the spotted hyena for 35 years, or Tim Carroll on cheetah for 35 years, or uh, some guy, some Swedish guy who couldn't help but uh, cross country all winter. He's got 35 years of data on the same landscape. So that's the empirical, empirical approach. So this is my approach. If I'm going to publish, it's not, it's not going to be positive, but it's going to be about habitat relationship. Where do I find mark the best? And that's called habitat suitability. Now, that's one language that doesn't show in landscape ecology. Question for the exam, what, what kind of, a, what's not covered in landscape ecology theory? And that's a good example, habitat suitability. So far, that's what I've come up with. I might have surprised if I read more on it. I'm sure some papers have considered it. But if you guys are in the bush every now and then, you'll know that some habitats are not as really as good as other habitats, correct? For beaver, I'm looking for more birch. So if I have less birch, I have less habitat quality. That suitability or chances. So I'm going to define it. That suitability is obviously the uh, don't I have this somewhere? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, right here. So uh, that suitability is a it's an index. So the, there's no real metric. It's not a density. The answer is not a density. It's a grading of some sort. So we'll call it ordinal scale, if you like. Nominal would be nice, but ordinal is that uh, from the one to four. Ordinal meaning there's an order, meaning that four is stronger than one, right? So, for example, more suitable. All right. So the index is uh, ordinal, and it combines, of course, all the uh, the background information that Robitaille has done walking in the field, say, again, black spruce marking. Okay, I'll write it down, I'll publish it. And these guys put it together and say, 20 years of uh, relationship here, this and that, and they put it together and say, it looks like black spruce. The significant mark is black spruce. I give it a four. So I'm keeping it simple. I could go into the details of uh, calculation song, which I've never done myself. But I'll tell you, I've done it for a number of species. So when the ministry decides to have a scientist, work on uh, something like that, which is a, a, a suitability index. They better have a good reason. So at some meeting at some point, when you say, is it the most uh, important species in the ecosystem? Right now I'm talking in uh, Ontario, so I'm talking forest. Wheel forest is complex, floor, shrubs, canopies, and a bunch of species. So why would I bother with spending a year and a half of computing on one species? Is the, the answer is simple because you need to, your excuse is that you convince your budget holders that your species, the one you want to work on, is an umbrella species. I think intuitively you understand the definition. I have some somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where it is yet. We'll see it before you. Uh, I put additional uh, names for it. But umbrella species is very uh, currently. So uh, we'll see the word flagship species and it's somewhere on the PowerPoint. Flagship is the same thing. Umbrella is the same thing. 
I want the synonym of the exam. Um, bioindicator is the same thing. So basically, the excuse is that I'm going to work on that because if I save the marker, update that marker habitat, I save most of the other species in the ecosystem. Another term that you will see is called capstone species, capstone. This goes from all this. this I'm giving the target to uh, <laughs> I think for your next project. So come on with that. Suddenly, woo. Raising some eyebrows around. So um, it's pretty. Uh, re keep in mind that it takes uh, 100 years of uh, field studies to understand if really Martin is a, an umbrella species, correct? So you really have to understand what its trophic position is and the ecosystem and so on. So it's a pretty much on top. But most people agree with it. They are they're happy to have found one species that hopefully if I manage correctly, I manage the rest correctly. An excuse for not uh, caring so much about the purple toad uh, somewhere uh, rare species. Uh, it could be, it could be a rare species, write it down. So the umbrella species could be a rare species. So uh, one thing is hard to find. Anybody wants to name an umbrella species for uh, the forest here in Ontario? Something uh, species you could be hoping to find that represents the untouched forest of Northern Salamanders? Yeah, which one do you think? Very good. Salamanders, very good. We talked about this possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which one? Yeah, there's one in the literature, so I didn't uh, bring this up. So, for example, the, uh, the Eastern Newt is very common. So no, the answer is no, wrong answer. Eastern newts is common. So that means whether the habitat is bad, Eastern newt, habitat is good, Eastern newt. Well, that's not an indicator of anything. How about finding an indicator that has in the blue spotted salmon? Good answer. So you'll find literature on that means we've been working on blue spotted salamanders. They have programs where they have a junior range uh, rangers during the summer. These guys leave with backpacks, they have plywoods, lay them out in the forest in the hundreds, uh, keep them wet and, and look for presence. Just simple occurrence of blue spider salad. Just occurrence, because the good news is they're not big migrators. So if you find one, you know it's a resident, right? I mean, they don't come from the Arctic uh, in November or something. All right. So sorry if there is a very little information on this slide, I'll uh, try to make that a little better. So, so uh, what I'm talking here is a big bracket on uh, for the uh, a, a way from the life difficulty again. I'm talking about the fine tuning of habitat. So the difference of habitat, which is not covered in life difficulty, they say habitat or matrix. Come on, guys. So, but again, what kind of habitat? So we talked about a few real uh, cases. Habitat journalists is one of them. Whoa, good luck. Habitat specialists, we know them. And often enough, they're so specialists that they're threatened, both of them. So blue spotted salamander definitely has high requirements for its uh, survival and reproduction. So we got the idea, bring that to the exam. The habitat suitability in modeling is very common, uh, typically called the HSI uh, habitat suitability index. And these two statements uh, are saying pretty much uh, the same thing. Uh, and you see like how general this is left, it says key environmental variable, please. Keep in mind that after seeing eight ecosystems, the number of key environmental variables, you better be born with very dogs if you're going to find out what drives them. So keep it modest. Uh, we're definitely uh, 
more familiar with Ontario species than elsewhere in the world. Can't learn that stuff. So here's an example taken from the, from the, the web. Just trying to explain probably Wikipedia. I'm sorry if I don't have the source here. Uh, very general, but I mean, uh, good for academic purposes. But uh, no uh, metrics, notice that. So of course, the, you know me by now. I have a graph I spend the time to describe it. You will describe it the final if I pick this one. So of course, this one without the legend, it says that definitely it's a habitat uh, issue. It measured the suitability on a scale from zero, meaning very, very bad, as in no habitat whatsoever, not suitable, unsuitable, and then one being perfect. Uh, so in order to integrate, so we're talking modeling, right? The idea is that you start small and you pick one variable that's key, correct? Right? You, you just you pinpoint a number of uh, key environmental variables this might have been done for a fish uh, i'm not exactly sure uh definitely we're looking at uh you know uh is the uh, oh geography so what's uh when the ocean uh when the uh, river saint lawrence goes into the atlantic what's the region between that has medium salinity ocean Full salinity, St. Lawrence is zero in between. What's in between? What's the fence? Come on, geographers. Where are you? Yeah. Tributaries. Oh, tributaries. That's a very good try. No. Estuary. Very close. Estuary. So around the world, but sharks who wait at the door and say, is it uh, salty enough? Oh, dairy, turn around. <laughs> it's not salty enough. This is what we're looking at. So some areas are suitable, some are not. And so it goes from zero, no scale. This is in, uh, I guess, uh, parts per trillion, I suppose. I'm not exactly sure. And uh, obviously there is a, uh, a medium, bottom line is medium salinity is the best. Too much is too much. Not enough is not enough, correct? So that's your curve right here. Predator, no surprise. And notice the pluses right here. So the model integrates those variables. And uh, you can give, of course, weights. Of course, if you think that predator will make a big difference, you can weigh this one three times in the equation for some reason. And of course, keeping as simple as possible. Um, and I would go to the public. If I open the petition in a minute, I want to publish all that kind of stuff. So you got to play with that, possibly uh, a data transformation, you know, uh, natural logs and so on, and uh, that to be on my, my little brain. So predator uh, abundance, obviously, uh, you know, uh, is, is the habitat most suitable is when there's no predator. Well, big surprise. Notice that this is not a linear relationship. You add one predator, it suddenly it makes a, creates a big impact. What is that? This is why you have this kind of curvy linear uh, response. Here you're at zero. The world is heaven. You just put one predator. Whoa, you just drop the suitability in a hurry. Because of course, if it's a barracuda, you know Nemo by now. If you haven't seen the movie, Nemo, N-E-M-O. One predator, one barracuda. By the way, barracuda don't eat eggs like that. Come on, guys. <laughs> so, uh, and then eventually, if you add some more, this is what I want to see. The curvy linear has to show in your, in your answer. So, obviously, as you add more, let's say you got 75 predators now. So, already pretty unsuitable, but you add one more big difference. This is why it tapers down here. Oh, the driver's going to say, what's well, one more predator? <laughs> I already got a hundred on my tail. Seagrass cover is important. So uh, totally unsuitable when there was no seagrass cover. Notice that uh, there's a plateau right here. So important that you have. Meaning if I add some more seagrass, I will not make it more suitable. They're just a bit, all right? So there's a, you don't have to 
uh, go crazy. In other words, uh, you will not find that a habitat more suitable with, uh, after a certain threshold value. So uh, a word on the uh, marking, which uh, of course I looked into uh, more than other species for sure. Closest I got to habitat modeling was a paper like this one with uh, Jeff Bowman, who was my lab at the time. He's now at the ministry at Trent and uh, takes my uh, under uh, takes some of the undergrads and you know eventually uh, get them into a master's program. So if you guys are interested, let me know. I'll give a good word uh, for you if you're interested in going into some more life development study, which he does all the time. He's a full time researcher and also no teaching, so he's got time. He does all kinds of stuff from, uh, he was involved with the Northeastern, Northwestern Wolverine population we might have had. And he's involved also with the uh, Northern Flying Squirrel. Uh, he's involved with Bobcat versus Slink, so he's all over the place. Well trained by Lawrence University. So this uh, very small paper here, this is what we had in mind at the time. We sat down and we were, he was, on habitat suitability and permanent circle search. We took 140 kilometers of uh, habitat data that we did in two minutes. So, do, uh, full winter snowshoes doing three kilometers a day, teams of two, three teams, so six kilometers a day for 40 days. And uh, every, every 100 meters, and we tried to see Jerry. Oh, that's not too much. Uh, when you die over your head, life's through. So the answer, Jerry, is uh, two point one meter. He traps Jerry. Yeah, zero. When you got that kind, yeah, of course. So we went on like that and just recorded very empirically tribes versus habitat. So as if we were just Darwin, you know, us. nothing else known about Mark. Mind you, in Tim ends, it's fine tuned because the landscape is like this. So basically, <laughs> once you get into black fruits forever, and then, you know, so the landscape, but it's been cut. So you get areas that are totally unsuitable for marking. Jack Pine is one of them. So, short story is I want to for the account to remember that uh, uh, one approach to habitat is called forest ecosystem classification. This is one of the approaches to uh, understand structure habitat of forest ecosystem classification. Now, again, very ambitious. If you guys are training at the wildlife center, they will send you for a little workshop like this. Because the word ecosystem is just what complicated because you uh, what you got for ecosystem again uh, question easy question for the exam on the abiotic so the soil suddenly the soil will make a difference on uh, which category of ecosystem you got all right so forest ecosystem classification 22 types <coughs> so yeah my opinion on it that uh, I was a crazy botanist, had too much coffee. So 22, within the same forest, you're within the same forest and you're likely to find 22 different groupings within, assemblages within, good luck. And that means that you get to a site, if you want to know if you're number one or number 22, you bring a trowel. Now that's a new approach. That means you have the so if it's black fruit, oh whoa, whoa, wait a second, there's clay different ecosystem. So not not exactly simple. Jeff and I we looked at this as they're crazy. So we were for another coffee. And then uh, decided to uh, boil it down a little bit and challenge it uh, essentially. There was another uh that suitability experts and Kind of discover and so on. So we tested our own mark tracks against what we could come up for, what we found in Timmy. And uh, to bring it down, so all that jargon right here is not really 
important. It's just a reminder so you can uh, go through uh, that material uh, when ready uh, when you're preparing for the exam. Just a reminder. Again, not much to remember here, uh, other than uh, five and seven. If uh, my question at the exam is, uh, I think we covered Bowman uh, et al. on 96. Uh, what again? Blank forest ecosystem classification. Good. What species marker? Good. And then the take home is that uh, out of the 22, there's some that uh, don't match the HSI, the established HSI. HSI was predicting a different response than what we found in these two categories. So in the black spruce, much more preferred from what we've seen. Seems that the, in, the, in the class, it's not a coincidence if I say Martin Black Bruce, because there is <laughs> that relationship. So yeah. So the existing HSI, I was predicting Black Bruce was a good habitat, but we said no, it's best habitat. So uh, and yeah, I put 5A, 5B together, we weren't uh, that uh, crazy. And then hardwood were avoided. So the take home, I believe, is both of them. Oh, no, this is an old part. I'll look at that. Oh, this one I came up with the take home. <laughs> yeah, no, I just uh, reformatted this. I'm very sorry, guys. Uh, I just uh, reformatted this bottom part right here, which is uh, uh, that uh, the side types are the 22 side types, correct? And they uh, deviated. So uh, type five was preferred and side type seven hardwood. Uh, hardwood is okay with everyone. We're talking birds and poplar, pretty much. In Northern Ontario. So there would be all the all right. And HSI and HSM are the same thing here. If you get locked in the acronyms right here, you see right here I've got that suitability matrix for the northeast HSI. So HSM just a name for one HSI. All right. On, uh, oh, we're really uh, going into a new chapter. I can't believe it. I'm a little scared. But uh, listen, it's got three slides, so we should be able to do it in uh, 45 minutes, right? Wow. This is a really short part. You can't have suggestions for a fourth slide anytime soon. I'll be happy. So uh, the idea is that uh, we're going uh, slowly towards Porter et al. Uh, 20, 20, 2021 landscape ecology. So we want to immerse ourselves. At the same time, it can help with bringing it together with the reality, the real world somewhere. So I always refer to Ontario because I don't know Australia that well. So, so the thing is, I right now I don't have an intro for landscapes because we talk so much about it. Uh, I'm just obsessed the guy. You have Jarvis, you be ready tomorrow for an exam on landscape ecology because you give me some terms right now. What about the audience? What do you got for uh, the jargon terminology that landscape ecology is used all the time? It's a cute is not a good answer. <laughs> How about patch? Good answer. Patch. Nobody uses that anywhere in the real world, but in landscape ecology, patch is a patch. So ocean patch, desert patch, uh, forest patch, very patch. It defines something. And that's record that's going to come over and over again. Yep. Edge patch. Yeah, edge, absolutely. Edge, absolutely. Uh, so, of course, we're going to develop a little more on that. I'm just warming up to a few uh, parameters that you have to leave for the final tomorrow. You've always, you've heard of habitat versus matrix. 
Let's uh, make it with capital letter. I'm a dot capital letter in the matrix. Oh. So the word patch is absolutely essential. Why? Because that's the argument of landscape ecology that patch is no more good, no more good. You find habitat, but you find a moose galore in one area. Whoa, 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 they say. If it's in just one patch, I don't care if it's 100 square kilometers, it's still one patch. I think you guys uh, know that intuitively. If you walk, uh, if you go, especially southern Ontario, southern anything, southern Quebec, southern Saskatchewan, and you hit big cities, and you have a park. Your park is a patch. Fantastic raccoon dance, and you're super high. Wait, 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 it says, like, the uh, this is just the one patch, so you don't know. If the rest of it will be just as good, the answer is not so good if it's surrounded by a bad thing. All right, so we've talked about this often enough, and you understand that the word patch becomes important because all the time the landscape includes patches. So, there, if you have a single patch, you don't have a land. It could have a landscape. We'll see some landscape with one patch, but that's too simple for us. We'll see why. All right. So uh, pretty simple right here. Just to remind you that if I were to tackle uh, landscape ecology in Ontario, I'd be in trouble. Because out of uh, the few ecosystems we pointed, I can remind you that uh, many ecosystems have covered. We have quite a few. So this is a possible combination of habitat versus matrix. You get that? So this is how I go from the real world into the landscape ecology. I might encounter, for example, right here, a forest that's a habitat. And that uh, is surrounded by prairies. Name one in Ontario for fun. Any uh, forest, uh, any forest prairie in uh, Interface in Ontario, anybody? It's all over the place. I'm going to say Manitowoc, good answer. Nope. Yeah, Manitowoc, uh, the forest. It's got that. Yeah. About uh, uh, maybe Manetville, ah, well, yeah, right. So forest and prairie. So you get the idea. We get that. So even natural prairies, Werner is still cultivated because it was uh, natural uh, prairie. So deposit area, and that goes on. The list goes on. So if I go for Ontario, this is what we end up with, uh, as far as I can see. There's very few uh, combinations we don't have. Well, that's why I always come to Ontario. You want to see, uh, I'm going to say, uh, well, I said forest prairies. Yeah, I'm going to say yes. Um, lakes, forest, uh, the law, and so on. So, uh, what was uh, a bit surprising to me, of course, is that. Tundra, you wouldn't think about it because we're so so much south, but really, we have plenty of uh, space to do uh, tundra. Habitat. Even oceans. So we have uh, the great rivers up north. They go from Timmins, they, uh, they flow towards James Bay. Salt water meeting fresh water right there. Fantastic. So, pretty, uh, pretty amazing and pretty daunting, actually. So, we're going to uh, spend a few more minutes here and try to 
this uh, so of course uh, I'm building the sorry sharing the screen. Oh, thank you. Uh, So the whole uh, textbook you have is on uh, uh, definitely on landscape ecology, but I think it really came from uh, Bono's uh, point uh, when the uh, university came up with uh, the very basic idea uh, that across the university, the researchers by Norm Perry, Perry, biomathematician. So yeah, she might be a kind of mathematician from the Solid brain on uh, structuring uh, concepts and ideas. So, already old paper, it has flying by 2003 to me, it's almost fresh. And so I said, finally, somebody came up with the concept here. And that was about the effect of contact factors on biodiversity. Um, notice the paper in the Bureau of Statistics uh, of the, sorry, the annual review. So, uh, looks like a very small topic, and yet, uh, we must have spent uh, many months, many years of working on this because this is called a meta analysis, right? And uh, so, right away, she started the project. She says, Oh my god, literature about that fragmentation. My type is fragmentation is crazy. It's all over the place. And biodiversity as well. So, of course, people are thinking of habitat loss and they think fragmentation and give them more funding. It happens that uh, Lenore, or I don't know her personally, <laughs> I'm going to call her Lenore. Uh, she uh, decided to uh, split the hair and say, whoa, 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 a second. Did you talk, did you mean fragmentation or habitat loss? So uh, she looked at, uh, she really uh, simulated fragmentation per se. That's the key of this paper. And she compared it to uh, what's been published and so on. And uh, so what's measured with fragmentation is uh, the magnitude. Magnitude is uh, how strong the effect might be. If I fragment something, my simple model, I think of a rock and uh, the ice goes through and it's fragmented. The amount of rock is the same, right? The rock is the same, I just split it in half, right? So suddenly I fragmented it without losing anything. So, the thing is, in the human world, we fragment because we lose stuff. We, it's always when the our habitat is going down and so on, and people so it's been fragmented, meaning it's been attacked and compromised, it's been broken in parcel, meaning small pieces and so on. Dr. Furry insists on saying, talk about that that lot, but if you break something in half, you don't necessarily lose watch what you're saying that's pretty much what she's been saying so so of course fragmentation can lead to different uh, conclusions so so depending on what you're measuring right here so whether it's actual loss or fragmentation every time you will deal with that say logging somebody runs and jerry runs uh logging in between two uh, plots did i lose or fragment or both Often enough, it's going to be both. This is what the problem we're facing is that in most, most of the time, we realize we have smaller patches simply because we remove some of the habitat. Right. 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, patch scale versus the landscape scale is very important. So uh, she insists on thinking uh, that we should uh, think of a broader scale all the time. Every time you're somewhere on site and you spot some population that's living there, that's one patch. And of course, no distinction between habitat loss and habitat fragmentation, most of the paper. So almost, it's almost like the text is saying both. But they're not both the same. They're not both the same. So it's very useful to think that fragmentation designates one thing and habitat loss designates another. So there are metrics for fragmentation. There are metrics for habitat loss. We'll see that in a second. So, uh, or probably more likely uh, next uh, next class. So let me uh, spend a few more minutes here. Uh, so habitat loss has large negative effect on biodiversity. So this lady right here is uh, looking at athletes that write the paper. Really Saturday morning too, and there are those with the details of one saying, what did they measure? What kind of response did the wildlife have? Loss, fragmentation. Or she had a huge file paper where they're saying ambiguous things. Saying the loss of magnetism was going. Like again, I can tell you every time we we tackle these issues because we remove some of that. So there, there's loss and it happens that there is all this fragmentation. So all right. Uh, so a very important is that her argument is that the habitat loss has some negative effects that are large. This is something that's a given. Everybody is alarmist about that, saying no oh, habitat loss and koalas and pandas and so on, all of that, right? Sure, I totally agree. And she says it's a dominant factor. So if you're looking at biodiversity, it's habitat loss that's going to be the problem. Less area, for example, less volume. But people should not uh, think that fragmentation itself is a factor. So you shouldn't be using that word if you mean habitat loss. Because habitat fragmentation has a much weaker effect on biodiversity. And the effects could even be positive. It, um, I think in the longer theory, I think we know that. Um, for example, uh, I'm thinking uh, Habitat forest uh, matrix would be um, shrubs. And uh, some animals will will like uh, like both. So suddenly you create a shrub area. So you call it a clearing in the forest. And suddenly you increase your biodiversity. You create small forest patches. People are worried, saying, oh, come on, Jerry, you remove that much forest? Come on. And you're saying, no, no. I just create two, I remove only 2%, so habitat loss is minimal. And look, I double my moves. Why? Because that corridor suddenly became uh, productive. So two patches might be favorable. So habitat, that's my bottom line. Habitat fragmentation, habitat loss negative, strong. Fragmentation can be positive or negative. Usually we don't like it. We think, oh, look at this beautiful patch and it's broken down. So I'm going to finish here because that's pretty dry. And this is the same thing as this one right here. That's how I make a big PowerPoint. I repeat this stuff all the time. So it's hard to read. So I just kind of type them down uh, the next, uh, the next uh, page here. So of course, the goal of the exam is to come up with a series. And of course, I try to keep it simple. These numbers represent the number of papers that refer to this or that. So the core information here is definitely this. So that means I see 12 uh, fragmentation variables. Good answer at the exam. I'd like to have five. That's not easy, but please give it a try. And questions like for biodiversity uh, variables, there are different uh, metrics you can use depending on the species. Of course. And I see 10, so another five would be great. Thank you very much. Now, going back to this uh, table quickly, it has information on who's been doing what. I think you realize that this is a meta analysis, it's a literary review. 
But when I see 26 on left, obviously I'm meaning that 26 papers have a measured abundance of size. Interpretation on a table like this is kind of an informative. Variable and a response that seems to be a little easier. Which one would you pick? And the answer is probably uh, the higher numbers here. If there's 26 papers, that's a mighty little simple mind. I have uh, 100, if I have 26 percent of papers who uh, look at patch size and abundance, you have an easier life. You're more likely to publish with those than with the rest. So, in other words, there's some that are extremely difficult. So here's another question, question one B. You have to stay away from a project. Which one would that be? Stuff that's uh, really difficult to do. Uh, population growth, I suppose. You have to stick around. So that's not easy. And then uh, patch and landscape scale, two different scales. You better have a few up there. Machines, I suppose. All right. So this is the way to read into the numbers of this paper. Of course, the key elements are these ones right here. Patch size is number one. I suppose they would put, put into some kind of a decreasing order of uh, uh, popularity. If I'm going to say that's what we do in research. Too. We pick the research that we can do, so we're more interested in this than this because it's doable. I can't work on that, right? So uh, I hope uh, that we're going to have a, a not going to, I'm not going to go into the details here, uh, but uh, definitely you should be able to uh, give me a very quick definition of each, right? So patch size, I mean, just the units, of course, patch size, we're talking square meters, uh, square kilometers, and so on. So, oh, sorry. Measure of measure of uh, uh, linear uh, surface or volume uh, is patch size. Keep that in mind. So I go detail. Linear is for linear habitats like a river. Area is very common. Surface area and then uh, volume if you're dealing with plankton, for example. This is not a very common one. I should pick a better example. Um, habitat loss amount did measure uh, enough, and that's uh, usually percentage. Uh, patch, patch isolation is usually a measure of distance for sure. Uh, the amount of veg, we'll see that it's not a simple calculation, but I think you understand. Uh, somewhere I'll argue that uh, in the real world it's pure health because you need uh, habitat that's just cut in half, just like you walk at Central Park. Who's been to Central Park? Anybody? There you go. Yeah. And the first thing you know, you're in uh, six lane traffic. The edge is right there. Look around the park right here and you go on. The Started that with the golf course, so if it's human made, the edges are clear. But many habitats will transition to the next day, to the matrix but with that a little depth. So edge, not exactly easy. Number of patches, you've got to travel further. Uh, structural connectivity, I've seen somewhere in that paper, and I'll I'll be uh, more detailed next uh, class. Why structural connectivity? He made the, the distinction between connectivity and corridors, so we'll see where that goes. But definitely, uh, uh, if you refer to James Gold uh, as a biologist, very happy with that. Matrix quality, suddenly that's pretty cool. Look, that we're already at seven. That means people, they go, okay, uh, forest field, ah, that's a matrix. We know it's a matrix. It's a bad habitat for the chemicals, man. But we don't but sometimes you have a matrix, the surroundings are not so, so bad, you're not exactly sure. 
what's a uh, lively would cottage country for example cottage country is not as suitable i guess as undeveloped area you know i spoke of these areas as well you still have some quality in the matrix a little tricky so that's why it's a little whoop. Oh, I lost my corner. It was a good good year until now. So matrix quality is definitely something uh, to look forward to as uh, science develop. Eventually, we'll get the tools to analyze matrix quality. Uh, I'm going to give you some uh, indications of how to go, uh, of course, online to get databases. You can imagine now these days that databases are extremely uh, more abundant than they were. Uh, qualitative only, not so good. Patch scale, uh, uh, very limited paper. Uh, landscape scale only, uh, very ambitious. I'm going to say very ambitious. And that's going to develop. So in other words, as we learn about certain areas, we're going to add more and people are going to build on existing sampling to understand and to address landscape scale issues. Uh, abundance, uh, of course, that's uh, population abundance, richness is at the community level. Um, I said I used the word guild before, guild, correct? So keep that in mind. Uh, as far as I know, I mean, I'm amazed if I see uh, two species of weasels, a market of fisher, and a wolverine in the same location, that's richness in the guild of mental carnival. Presence, absence, an easy one. Fitness measures, anybody? And I want to finish in two minutes, so I answer quickly. What kind of fitness measures are we talking about? Yeah. Birth rates? Birth rates? Rates of birth. Uh, birth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, birth for sure, not so easy. So you're going to be with a short lived animal to wait for Canada to reproduce. That's your health. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to see fit, uh, indirect fitness, fitness of measure something. Uh, the, the animal can tell you that it's going to give birth like crazy. Yeah. You have an answer? No. Yeah. No. So what kind of measure do you take in the animal? That can tell you that uh, it's going to be lots of birth. That the, the animal is going to be fit, fit for reproduction. I'm going to say fat, so fat level. And then if you don't get to fat, you can get to diet. And if the stomachs are full, this animal has a better chance of being fit than an animal that's starving. Correct? So fitness measures, again, they could be direct, as in the liver size. Uh, in birth, I suppose, quite uh, accessible. And otherwise, uh, indirect uh, fitness measures. Uh, Mr. Callum, I finished the course of that beauty. So, in which animal we think uh, the color of it has the fitness? Oh, good answer. The puppy, you heard that? The, he didn't say the food, he said the puppy. <laughs> the puppy. All the same, the fruit loops and the parrots and all these the highly colored animals so that for a long time people think. The color must mean something to the female. If she's going to pick between different males, pop up picks the one that that's more to the color. And that's true enough. Color probably grows with age, just like a uh, moon, you know, female moon will, a cow will pick a bull for its uh, fighting ability. So the, the size of the rock. And, uh, and Adam, that's called the handicap, uh, uh, called handicap of survival, survival handicap. So uh, to a female, an, uh, an eight-year-old male who has, I'm think, uh, thinking moose, has a huge antlers. This animal that was able, she is looking at him and she said, how this animal survived eight years with that thing on its head? I like him. He's a survivor. It's all a handicap of survival. So, same for the color, Adam. That could be true as well. Why would the birds make themselves so conspicuous to predators? 
is because he's telling the female, not only can I make some nice protein, but also, look, I've been showing my colors around and nobody can get to me. So I'm an athlete with bright colors. So I'm going to stop right here. Thanks for showing up, guys.